through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 175. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of the remake mm -hmm. of Total Recall, yes. we're going to be discussing Philip K. Dick, oh, yes. whose work has influenced mm -hmm. so many major yes. films that have been released in the author. last 30 years. Deceased author. author. Deceased. Long deceased. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of one of the interesting points, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm. in that essentially all the films that have been major releases based yes. on his work have occurred after his death. Yes. He and never... they've all been about, almost all of them been about the future. Yeah, I mean, that sort of makes sense, I suppose. But it's one of those things that he never really got to appreciate mm -hmm. what became of his work. Yes. So, if he's looking down from somewhere, he's probably really <laughs> enjoying himself. Floating now. around the space dust. Yeah. Be like, I was right! <laughs> I just think it's interesting that someone who has been long dead could have works about the future that came out in the future and were still relevantly in the future. It's kind of an interesting... Yeah. Totally. It's not even like he's some dude in the 80s who was like, no, it's going to go this way. He was some dude already dead by the time the 80s came around who would... Well, you think about, like, George Orwell, same way yeah. with 1984. I mean, granted, 1984 is long past, but it's still like... It's true. That book is still so relevant mm -hmm. in terms of our culture now. So. Yeah. And, and he... still very futuristic. Yes. Anyway, the first one we're going to talk about is one of probably the most well-known of them. Probably and set the trend of... Set the trend music. shortly after his death, sadly, too. Really? Wow. 1982's Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. Based on do androids dream of electric sheep, yes. I believe? Yes, yeah. which is kind of... Let's let's set that stale. It's a novel set in a post-apocalyptic post near future where Earth and its population have been damaged by the nuclear war. Uh, most types of animals are endangered or extinct due mm -hmm. to extreme radiation and poisoning. To own an animal is a sign of status and... Uh, you know, uh, what is emphasized more is the empathic emotions humans experience towards an animal. Mm. And, you know, Deckard is facing retiring um, as sort of the most uh, advanced model of Android, mm. the latest, you know. Because of this task, the novel explores the issue of what it is to be human. Unlike humans, androids don't possess, you know, empathetic sense. Mm -hmm. In essence, Deckard probes the existence of of defining qualities that separate humans from androids. Hmm. Which, I mean, the movie is much more focused on who is an Deckard. android yeah. and what, you and know. And Deckard as an investigator chasing after androids. The androids, yeah. So it's a, it, replicants. I mean, it's it's a bit of a stretch mm -hmm. from the, the book to the movie, yeah. but there is still that There's still essence. that aspect of what is human and reality and being slightly unsure yes. of, of it, yeah. And this is the... It's one of his major themes is the weird reality. Yes, and this is the Ridley Scott directed film yes. starring Harrison Ford. I mean, mm -hmm. this Sean is... Sean Penn. Rudger Hauer. Or not Sean Penn. Um, Sean Young. Sean Young. Yes. Rutger Ooh. Howard. Edward James Olmos. And Daryl uh, Hannah. <laughs> Daryl Hannah. And this is one of those films that had like a numerous versions mm -hmm. of it that have come out yes. that really, have, especially all around it, the time it was actually out. Like uh, I think DVDs I mean, done. The, I mean, like pre DVD VHS era. Like there was all like in I believe still the eighties, early nineties is when a lot of these. I, I remember it a lot on the DVDs, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's obviously sort of exploring, you know. Is Deckard a, a, mm -hmm. an android, and that being yeah. sort of the real thing as to how ambiguous they leave it yes. versus how sort of non-ambiguous yes. it gets, and exactly. uh, I, get, I think that's one of the most defining elements of the film. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I still love Br Blade Runner. I think it's, it's so an amazing good. film. I'm surprised they haven't actually re remade this one. Mm. I mean, you think this would be like the most obvious one of Philip K. Dick's works to be remade? Mm. I mean, it's probably yeah. because. Ridley Scott's still around and now working on our Blade Runner sequel. So they're yeah, <laughs> the actually, that's kind of sacrosanct. Probably that's, still. that's probably a good point that the sequel is taking priority over a mm -hmm. reboot. But I, I imagine, you know, once that's out of the way, yeah, unless sadly. he wants to do more sequels, it's. And it's funny to think about this being a Harrison Ford film because, mm -hmm. you know, he's done so many signature roles. Yeah. And yet Blade Runner sadly falls. Yeah. Low because theatrically at least it was a bomb. Like it was not oh, a yeah, hit. Definitely. And unlike a lot of the Philip K. Dick novels that end up being big budget mm -hmm. movies, at least during the beginning of the run, sort yes. of it's tapered off as it's gone on. But early on, they mm -hmm. were all involved in big hits. Yeah. And so this one sort of gets forgotten amongst all that yeah. because a it was so strange theatrical bomb, but I mean it became a huge thing. Oh on yeah, DVD. beyond just cult classic, I think yeah, it's so. been re-recognized. It also kind of. Uh, um, 
uh, brain went away. I don't remember on the Total Recall. Well, let's I just say, you know, a yeah. couple Academy Award nominations mm -hmm. for visual effects and art design. Oh, yes. So, uh, well deserved. A uh, rel relatively recent thing that's slightly topical. Uh, Christopher Nolan, when he started mm -hmm. shooting Batman Begins, showed yes. his whole crew yep. Blade Runner. That's a great point, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And saying, this is what we're going to do with yep. this movie. This so. is how, this is the level of darkness and future, etc. Next up, as you mentioned, the original Total Recall mm -hmm. from 1990. Uh, directed by Paul Verhoeven, mm -hmm. based on the short story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, mm -hmm. which is essentially a story about a man who wants to visit Mars, unable to afford it. He visits a company called Recall yes. that offers implanted memories, <laughs> uh, attempts to implant some exciting memories, um, as an undercover government agent. Yeah, and the process messes up the fact that he's an undercover agent, right? And kind of... Uh, actually is an undercover agent, yeah. And he heads home, finds evidence to support his new old memories. Mm -hmm. His handlers seek his death. Yes. But, you know, actually being an assassin, he avoids this and goes on the run. Unfortunately, the implanted device uh, can be used to read his thoughts, and mm -hmm. therefore he makes a deal, you know, to replace his memories with a false memory. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 fairly, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot in common with the movie. With the, with the, with the Schwarzenegger version, yes, definitely. Yes. Um, and uh, here coming up another one of the other things that's very thematic in his roles, which is paranoia of technology and what it can mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Like the everybody's out to get you... You know? <laughs> and I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's funny to think back in terms of Arnold Schwarzenegger's mm. films. Total Recall is probably one of, one of the more cerebral in his early yeah, careers. Well, it, that careers. plus, you know, it's also one of the most beloved, but also sort of one of the often forgotten ones in mm -hmm. some ways. I mean, a lot of people always, you know, think, oh, Terminator, yeah. blah, blah, blah. They think the big action roles. But yeah. I mean, this one is. A pretty awesome film. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. I mean, I, there are other ones that you know I have special places in my heart for, like um, <laughs> Commando, Running Man, uh, Running Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but at the same time, like Total Recall is a pretty a pretty fun film. I yeah, mean, and it it has it, it's one of those things where while it's still sci-fi and it's futuristic, it was made in the in the night. Well, very 90. end. Yeah, so beginning of nineties, early. So like the eighties feel was still there, and the movie has that feel but it's in such a way that rather than looking i think cheesy i think it fits with the kind of weird fashion and style they want of the future because it's just so strange even to us now looking back at 80s fashion that mm -hmm. it almost might as well be fashion on a different planet i mean again you might know much like blade runner this got all sorts of uh academy award nominations it got mm. best sound best sound editing it nominations it won um special achievement award hmm. for you know effects hmm. um it's it's a fun film. I mean, I think sadly like, it's sort of maligned that the thing people always talk about is the three boobed woman. Yeah. And that's like the other they thing. They should be talking about Quato. Yeah. It's be Quato. And the other thing that I always find funny is that uh, Stil or Schwarzenegger gets involved with Rachel Tichten. <laughs> Uh, as opposed to, you know, like, Sharon Stone mm -hmm. in the original. And it was always, like, it felt like a bit of a downgrade. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was, like, yeah. she's not, like, yeah. unattractive, yeah. but yeah. it was just sort of, like, I, you know, I take my chances that's, with Sharon that's, Stone. That's one of the few areas I'll give the new one is, you know, Jessica Peel. Don't get me wrong, it's hard to compete ever against Kate Beckinsale. Right. No, but totally. at least Jessica Beale is an appropriately, like, high caliber where you wouldn't, you wouldn't like, look at... Like it was in this situation because I totally remember feeling that we're being like really overshared. So. It, it was just like you know if we're huh. go, if we're going like in terms of like the most attractive one. You, you, I mean, which is kind of stupid basis. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's, it's. I mean, you, obviously she's not. She's trying to kill him, so yes. it's like yes. understand what's going on the way. But it's sort of like I kind of take my chances. But she's, <laughs> she's, she's this is Sharon Stone during her prime. That's true. Yes. So I, I mean, again, that's that's sort of another problem I have with the remake is that everyone's just too beautiful. Yeah. Like at least yeah. at least in this one. You know, our Schwarzenegger is not particularly attractive. In time, in time. <laughs> yeah, but like nothing but beautiful. Yeah, people. exactly. Sort of like there's, a, there's like let's just make everyone like normal looking. How about mm -hmm. that? But yeah. you know, at least Arnie's kind of normal looking in the sense that he might be humongous, but at least he's got a fugly face. Oh, totally. Everyone's normal except Sharon Stone. <laughs> yeah. Sharon Stone is yeah. definitely the odd duck in yeah. this yeah. scenario. <laughs> 
much. I'm gonna skip a while ahead before yeah. like the next significant release. Based special on effects and technology yes. kind of had to catch Caught up. It. Exactly, and that was 2002's Minority Report. Yes, this is based on the short story The Minority Report from 1956, which is about a future society where murders are prevented through the efforts of three mutants who can see the mm -hmm. future. Paradoxes and alternate uh, realities are created by precognition of mm -hmm. crimes when the chief of police interprets a precognition that he is the murderer of a man he never met. The story also touched upon the dangers of a powerful post-war post post military during peacetime. Hmm. Like many dealing like many stories dealing with knowledge of future events the minority report questions the existence of free will hmm. um and you know i i'm try i think about it in terms of like you know steven spielberg's recent yeah i always work. forget that this is spielberg a i forget that it's spielberg it's probably one of the films of his recent work that i've enjoyed the most honestly mm. like it's, yeah it's hard I to mean, think yeah. about like a steven spielberg it's not gonna be ai or indiana jones 4 i mean he's done some stuff you know munich whatever there's been mm -hmm. some good ones yeah but there's nothing you know Indiana Jones early films yeah. that were so great or that Jaws. stand out. Or, exactly. <laughs> Close and Garrett's the third kind. Yeah. Something like that where that's so good that stands out like this is probably amongst the best work that he's yeah. done in the recent history. Probably one of Tom Cruise's better uh, sci-fi roles. Totally. I, mean, I don't actually totally. know how many he's been in, so that's probably not much of a statement. Oh, he's, he's done a fair amount. You know, like War, War, War oh, of the yeah. Worlds, oh, yeah. which was Ooh, both Spielberg yeah. and him. That's true. Which yeah. was actually fairly enjoyable until the end. Yeah. But this one, I, I mean, I thought was a, mm -hmm. a fun ro a ride. You know, you had... Um, Doesn't this have Sean Bean in it? I forget. I forget uh, if this one of the movies he dies Sean in. Bean. I, I, remember I just think no, I'm thinking Equilibrium. Sorry. Yes. Uh, this is like people like Max von Sydow mm -hmm. or Sydow, uh, Neil McDonough, who's always a villain, mm -hmm. Steve Harris, um, and it's a great cast. I, I, it's just a fun film, and it seems fairly. Uh, consistent with the mm -hmm. novel is based on, which is great. And you think about that, the novel's from 1956. Yeah. This is more than, what, almost 50 years yeah. after the novel was written. <laughs> it's still yeah. still advanced for where we are now. Yeah. Like, it, it very well, we still could go there. We, yeah. It's, there's nothing to say. When this that was this... written, women couldn't vote. Is that true? When did they get the Or no, suffrage? I mean, black people couldn't vote. Okay. Sorry. I was when like, did they get the that, civil rights? The that suffrage is a 60s? late 20s, early 30s. Okay, but I'm thinking civil, civil rights, rights was 60s? Was yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Woo. Factual accuracy. Brandy would kill me yeah. for that one. Sorry. Yes. But, you know, it's a fun film. Got to gotta appreciate mm -hmm. that. But, then, uh, however, turn... Well, <laughs> quick note. This is probably about the point at which the profitability for the Philip K. Dick film started yes. to drastically crash. Mm -hmm. uh, this one made almost $400 million wow. worldwide, so still still fairly successful. Mm -hmm. That sort of changed about a year <laughs> later with Paycheck yes. from director John Woo, starring Ben Affleck, oh. which is, let's see... John Woo, go back to not doing American movies. Just don't, don't make American movies. It's based on a short story... Paycheck from Philip mm. K. Dick mm -hmm. from 1952, so mm -hmm. more than 50 years in advance, um, from the 19, June 53 issue of Imagination, mm -hmm. which is the story of Jennings, a talented engineer who comes to terms on a contract that he will work for two years on a secret project, then have his memory erased and be paid a ton of money. Uh, he wakes up after that, foregoing the money in exchange, getting an envelope of trinkets. Hmm. Um, he ends up discovering, you know, that what he he goes back to find out what he worked on, yes. and you know, to discover danger. what happened, what he, what memories he lost. Exactly, and in essence, that's the same that the movie was based yes. on. Um, you know, the film gets a lot of crap for being, you know, essentially Ben Affleck just going to cash a paycheck. Yeah, and it was right in the whole bubble. I mean, it was in yes. the really Geely. right in that Geely Je Benifer. Yeah, Benifer. That's right resounding crap storm and so a lot of anything he did that wasn't good got even more hate so and that I actually didn't, didn't I, I don't hate help. the film i kind of i think the concept is kind of interesting i think you know mm -hmm. the idea of like wiping memories mm -hmm. this is pre eternal sunshine of the spotless mind yes um and I, I i like i like that i like mm -hmm. the mystery of trying to figure out it's sort of like memento figuring mm -hmm. out what you did in your life figure out a yeah. mystery like that if you don't have the memory mm -hmm. um 
so it's got you know like essentially eternal sunshine meets <laughs> memento if you sold me yeah, that movie yeah, i'd yeah. be that sounds awesome and then be like it's an action film and it stars ben affleck yeah like those are all things that i generally enjoy <laughs> so it's not one of uma thurman's best roles no she's kind of weak in it and uh, aaron eckhart is kind of a cheesy villain yeah um, this was kind of before he was big enough and i think when Ben Affleck was so huge at the time to have him going mano a mano against somebody that no one knew about in a movie that seemed flashy and special effects ridden, I don't think people wanted it. That's sort of the thing I think was the biggest problem is that they focus more on making it an action film than yes. just letting the plot yes. play out. And you should let it be really mysterious and twisted and dark like Minority Report was the year prior, right? Yeah. Wasn't it just the yep, year, year prior? prior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But instead they tried to make it all flashy and... Like, the whole orange and blue color scheme forever through the whole movie. Ugh. And, you know, Ben Affleck won a Razzie Award for mm. this and a few other films. But, <laughs> I mean, I don't think this is necessarily a Razzie no. deserving. No. I think it's more of the other films that he's been in. I oh, think yeah. it's Geely and all that sort of stuff yeah. is going on at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Benifer, excuse me. Um, Pearl Harbor? Ooh. Ah, uh, that was before this. I I'm think. just saying, though, as far as bad Ben yeah. Affleck. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I don't even think he's the problem in that film, honestly. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> There's a lot of problems yeah, with that film. Exactly. <laughs> but still. But, like, it's just, it feels it feels that this fair this film gets unfairly criticized. Mm -hmm. I would like to go back and rewatch it. I think do it, a round table. Yeah. I would be up for that, actually. I'd do it. Uh, I, think, I think it's one of those films that there's so much venom towards... Ben mm -hmm. Affleck and Benifer and stuff going on yeah. that it sort of got unfairly yeah. evaluated and I think you know I don't think it's great yeah but I think it's okay mm -hmm. I mean it's fine yeah so whatever it's a really neat story it's the, they could have made it a lot more haunting and mysterious but oh well yes next up we're going to talk about one of your favorites mm -hmm. A Scanner Darkly um, this is based on was it uh, A Scanner Darkly mm -hmm. science fiction novel by Philip K. Dick I believe from 1977 hmm. which is one of the later ones he mm -hmm. worked on it's about protagonist Bob Arctor is that right Arctor? I think so yeah. they which they yeah. I oh, know they kept that in this one. Yeah. Um, member of a drug um, undercover police task force mm -hmm. that you know uh, was it? He wears an, uh, essentially. Yeah, uh, they have these weird suits that kind of just shield his true identity. Yeah. Change their you know, voice and and how they look. Essentially, he becomes addicted to a drug mm -hmm. that he's trying to investigate. Yes. He's sent to rehab for that drug mm -hmm. and you which know. is starting to have like long-term effects on him and it's a drug that affects your brain yes so a neurocognitive deficit mm -hmm. and you know sort of ultimately sort of like he becomes a shell of what he used to mm -hmm. be and sort of like he can't be taken seriously because of that mm -hmm. even though he's he is able to find evidence of drugs mm -hmm. at rehab and as he and starts like getting that. more clues into the actual case he also starts getting deeper into things that make him less reliable as a as an agent of law yes. and things get more chaotic. Yes. Um, obviously, this is Richard Linklater's rotos rotoscoped yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, film, so it's very visually mm -hmm. interesting, very different from any of the other mm -hmm. K. Dick adaptations. Yes. Uh, I mean, how how much does the, the movie, I can't even remember, parallel this short story like I just described? Pretty... It's pretty, pretty accurate. Yeah, pretty directly. I mean... Uh, I haven't read the story, but uh, it's one of those ones that uh, just the suit he would wear that chides his identity, like mm -hmm. the way they were able to visually do that, I think alone justified the rotoscoping. The, the rotoscoping. That and the fact that it's a neurological drug. Mm. And so to be able to have effects that were real when you're already in an animated style, it's, it, it's easier to have weird non real not you know non real mm. hallucinations and things like that that fit in i think when you're already in an animated style so that's probably one of the better examples of keanu reeves yeah I mean, why I, not a writer i think he also i think there's um at the end of this movie it's dedicated to like all these people that had this i don't know if it was like a type of paranoid schizophrenia or mm. were in a hospital that philip k dick was also in or visited or like a rehab Well, I, th center? I think the, f the novel is semi-autobiographical. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean... I, I think you're right, yeah. I, no, I mean, it is. It is oh, okay. semi-autobiographical. Um, so, it's interesting to think about, you know, what Philip K. Dick's mm -hmm. experiences were. I mean, this is definitely much more sort of, I would guess, a reality-based one. This is mm -hmm. less sort of, a, like, futuristic sci-fi yes. as much yes. as, like, based in 
present. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is probably, you know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is probably around yeah. the same time yeah. that this came out. And so you think about how they treated, you know, people mm-hmm. in mental institutions yeah. at that point. And so. rehab was like not, not anything like we think of it today. It yeah. was actually like hardcore. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you know, like um, Electroshock mm-hmm. and all that stuff yeah. was super popular back mm-hmm. then. So very different. Gonna skip uh, a year forward <laughs> to talk about next. The Can Nick we just K- say next and move past? Yeah, no, I'll talk about it. <laughs> I know. I just this, this is based I just on to make that joke. Well, this one, I think this one's one of the most interesting ones actually, mm. um, in terms of like adapting it to mm. a film. Okay. This is based on a novel, The Golden Man, mm. which yes. is a short novelette, as was described as, mm-hmm. about a um, uh, members of the government agency tasked with tracking down and sterilizing uh, mutant individuals hmm. with physical abnormalities and superhuman powers, uh, such as the ability to steal the appearance and memories of others, hmm. and that makes them a threat to normal humans. Uh, the Golden Man is a feral young man named Chris with golden colored skin who does not appear to be sapient, but possesses the ability to see into the future, wow. specifically the ability to see the outcomes from a single action. Um, huh possibly five moves ahead Uh, unknown to the agency you know uh turns out he possesses another power that his skin acts like a lion's mane and allows him to seduce members of the opposite sex influences his fiance into freeing him and impregnates her (laughs) and makes him uh, escape um that is so different (laughs) it ends with the protagonist reflecting on how animal instincts have triumph over human intellect and how (laughs) evolution will take uh over, you know, that sounds that means. fascinating, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and it's it's really interesting how they totally <laughs> watered that down how, in the how movie. They took the whole aspect of him having a lion-like flowing mane and just gave or Nick just, Cage longer hair, or and just, that was the extent of essentially that whole eliminating plot. the whole mutant angle entirely. Oh, yeah. I can just see Nicolas Cage be like, "No, lion mane, I got this covered." <laughs> Totally, that's Cut that out of the plot. We've got it right here. Look, the, look at this. Look at these sweet locks. That is true. That is absolutely true. But it's sort of it's. And it, did you see this movie? Yes. Sadly. I actually I actually rented this movie on DVD from Netflix, and I I was curious about this movie. Mm-hmm. I was I was curious based on the trailer, and I knew yeah. I'd gotten a huge amount of crap about yeah. it, and I didn't hate it per se. The thing that I disliked about the movie is when they retcon like the yes. last 30 yes. minutes of the story. Yes. Yes. Essentially be like, it's all yes. him just looking yes. into the future. Because he can look more uh-huh. into the future with this girl. Yeah, that was so stupid. A, that was stupid. And Jessica Biel being his love interest. That was absurd. <laughs> yeah, like, any, like that's Jessica never gonna happen. Love with yeah, yeah, that's never gonna happen. Didn't like. that Julian Moore in it, too? Yeah. Oh, she was terrible in this movie, if yeah, I remember Yeah, she was correctly. like the government agent terrible. trying to work with them. It's, it's so dramatically she changed. She so from, good, but she was not in this. It's it's really weird to think about how much they changed. Yeah, they just took their... the fact that he can see the future. That's really it. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> that's really it. Yeah. Why, why not just make a story about a guy who can see the future... And say it's loosely based on it, rather than have giving giving it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it my really, whole problem with book adaptations. It, it really, I mean, it is. This is like, yeah, I mean, this is sort of like based on a true story. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't actually based on a true story, but it's just like how loose they base yeah. some movies oh, based yeah, on totally. a true story. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> to be fair, like it it probably is easier to sell this their storyline in the true. movie than the like mutant true lion's mane yeah. golden skin yeah. mutant storyline probably, probably but thankfully never... they didn't use the name the golden man so they could still make a movie called the golden man in the same sense of like the Omega Man and I Am Legend, yeah. where it's, I'd be, you know. I mean, I, I, I don't know why they decided to like retcon the entire <laughs> last thirty minutes. So as far as I can tell, that is not in the original story. Like mm. the original mm-hmm. story is yeah. a sort of a mashup of like what they made with um, Omega Man, essentially yeah. with like some sort of creatures rising mm-hmm. up and taking over the world. Yeah. So I don't know. It's weird. It's, it's a weird. It's very one. strange film. Uh, next one that is actually one that I really appreciate quite a bit. I did too. Which is the Adjustment Bureau mm-hmm. from last year, which is, let's see, it's based on the uh, Adjustment Team mm. from 1954, which is okay. a short story, um, which is about um, a sector that's scheduled for adjustment. Uh, one of them is um, this guy is essentially heading to work. Uh, things end up not happening mm-hmm. in the time they are expected to. He yes. gets to work and sees them adjusting everyone. Yes, that's right. Um, and sort of like it's re- rearranging memories. Yes, and, and instead of being de-energized, they sort of let him go on with his life as long as um, 
he doesn't go on and sort of tell everyone else. Yes, as long as he never tells anybody. And he sort of... Um, so he says he'll wipe his brain if he does. He feels like he's experienced a psychotic episode. Mm-hmm. He sort of tells his wife. Um, they are going to sort of wipe him as okay. long as he's sort of like, don't do this again. Um, let's see, wait. Um, yes, and he performs, you know, vital work. So they're going to let him sort of... So he works with them, kind of. Right, but they're saying the adjustment team performs their work um, to bring a, a chain of events that will lessen Soviet Western Bloc tension. Interesting. Which is kind of interesting, yeah. Interesting. And, you know, he is allowed to return uh, without being adjusted that he tells no one, but ultimately sort of... Um, te- uh, he sort of... He's got to tell her that it was just like a temporary fit, mm. and she knows the truth that it wasn't, hmm. and so like it sort of ends, I think, with them coming to de-energize him ultimately. Um, which, I mean, is different from the the, yes. the current version. Obviously, the Cold War tensions are eliminated. Mm-hmm. The love story is created, which yes. it already was present in the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not really like he believes he has a psychotic break. It's more sort of yeah. about him trying to overcome um, the... Stuff he doesn't understand. Well, it's sort of that free will <laughs> versus predeterminism mm, yes. again, like yes. we spoke of in the past. Yeah, they talk and about the plan a lot. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, I... I mean, the novel sounds very interesting in its own right, mm-hmm. Just but for the, the mo- Soviet block. Yeah, aspect. the movie is very different from it, and mm. pretty cool in its own right. I enjoyed I really, the adjustment bureau quite a bit. So did I. I really, I really liked what they did with it. I thought it was very fun. I liked mm-hmm. the chemistry between Matt Damon and Emily Blunt was mm-hmm. fantastic. I thought the whole adjustment bureau itself, with you know, like Anthony Mackie, mm-hmm. John Slattery, all mm-hmm. of them was really great. John Slattery. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very a I very very fun film. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed both of them, and I'd be curious to check out this... The Adjustment no, Team? Yeah. yeah. The, no, the short story, mm-hmm. because it's so interesting and different, and yeah. so of its era also. I mean, yeah. this is one of the true. other ones besides... Um, Scanner Darkly. Scanner Darkly, that really seems of a much more past-centric mm-hmm. idea. Though, yeah. I mean, I can't say that couldn't necessarily be true to this day still. I mean, they updated it very well in the Adjustment Bureau. That's true. So. Yes, they did. I, that. That I like the fact that they managed to have people in fedoras and still make give a, give a reason for it. I wish I could wear a fedora. I don't have a head I, for it. I, I, yeah. I just wish... Yeah, same here. Uh, that brings us to this Friday, <sighs> August 3rd. The remake, Total Recall, is mm-hmm. coming out. This is the one starring, let's see, Colin Farrell, mm-hmm. uh, Jessica Biel, Kate, Kate Beckinsale, 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 Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston, Bill Nighy. I think he's pl- taking... Uh, Michael Ironside's role. Interesting. Correctly, isn't Michael Ironside the villain in Total Recall? Uh, as I, I recall, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, the. Yes. Anyway, but anyway, this is sort of like the beautiful people mm. version of no, it's different role for okay. Ronnie Cox is who. Okay. He okay. takes the role from. Okay. Um, this is Thank the beautiful, beautiful person version. Of, <laughs> yes. Um, Total Recall, which for some reason not only still has the triple-breasted hooker. Who's but, gorgeous this time? St- still has it. Okay, whatever. Oh, they, cool nod. They, whatever. Had, no, they had to but do But not it. on Mars. Well, that's the whole point. Like that's what everyone's obsessed with with the original Total that's Recall. True. So they had to have that nod. I just want Quato, but yeah, no. I just want, I just want yeah. Quato. Is yeah. that too much to ask for a deformed, weird, hideous man, baby thing coming out of some guy's chest? Yeah. Is that really so much to ask, yeah. Spencer? People at home, am I asking so much? No, no. And to be fair, I think Colin Farrell is a better, <laughs> better actor than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes. I think Kate Beckinsale is an underappreciated actress. Probably at least on par with uh, yeah. uh, what's Sharon, her name? Stone. Sharon Stone. Okay. Uh, give you Jessica that one. Biel. Hmm. Probably. I don't know if she's a better actress than Rachel <laughs> Tichten. But she's all right. She's okay. She's, she's not okay. bad. And, you know, you got other people in supporting roles like Brian Cranston, mm-hmm. Bill Nahi, Ethan Hawke, John Cho. I mean, you got some decent people in this film mm-hmm. supporting roles. I don't necessarily. Len Weissman, the guy who did all the Underworlds, who's married to Kate Beckinsale, yes. is an okay director. He, oh, he's the director. Sort of stylish. Um, what a surprise that in Kate terms Beckinsale is. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I don't necessarily look at his films and think they're necessarily going to be great. Mm-hmm. Just matter of fact. Popcorn I, movie. I think the this. fact that special effects are probably in a better place in terms of making yes. this film than the original one. Yes, that's definitely true. And, so, and I will give them that the uh, car chase looking scenes that they have, the flying cars, that looks pretty cool. And to be fair, like, I'm but not... it's looking pretty cool enough. No. 
to be fair, I'm not so invested in the original that I don't think it's above being remade. Like, I don't think Arnold Schwarzenegger is such a good actor yeah. that's like, this can't be redone. That's true. But like do if I someone think... someone was like, I'm remaking Commando, I wouldn't shed a tear. Yeah. But to, to be honest, like, do I think that this was a film that needed to be remade? Nope. Probably not. So... But... You know, it is the the new era of filmmaking where all we ever do is remake and reboot and sequel things. Yeah. So, that being said, I, I probably will check it out at some point. I'm I'm a little bit curious. This is not. This is August. You know, last year I didn't think Rise of the Planet of the Apes could have been great, and it's it true. was. So, who point. knows? This could surprise me. And you know, let us know your thoughts about this and other K, Philip K. Dick uh, novels or mm -hmm. remakes as your mm -hmm. or novellas, whatever. His film yeah. interpretations. Yes, there you go. Adaptations. There you go. There you, there you go. Yeah. And that. join us next week for our, our rundown of, was it August 7th? Mm -hmm. And check us out at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, uh, phone number 323-761-9842, iTunes, Blip.TV, Miro, Roku. Okay, Clue. Check in. We'll see you next time. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This tank don't even try to buy the side style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.